Welcome everyone. Hello. All right. One moment, everyone. Get us adjusted. Um, and Phyllis, welcome. You can turn your camera off. <laughs> Hello. Hello yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I Phyllis. just want to make sure I'm on the right. Um, am I? Am I okay? I don't have to get off. Okay. You're good. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry um, about the confusion. No, you're good. But welcome, everyone. Phyllis, you want to turn your camera? Um, I'll turn it off. Okay. Yeah. You're good. Um, my name is Emma, um, <laughs> and I'm so excited to be here today with everyone. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm so honored to welcome you all to this virtual space. This is the first event in our Home in the Bay project. Um, and this event series is a project intending to cultivate community. Um, we are bringing together so many amazing people and organizations who are doing the great work of caring for each other in a time so full of trauma and hardship. The Bay Area is an epicenter for so many of the intersections of these experiences of colonization and gentrification, homelessness, migration. These are things that impact all of us, but in this place in particular, and we want to honor everyone who is here taking time to be in community with us, especially our amazing partner organizations and the readers and activists, artists and storytellers that are here today to share their own experiences in their own words. I am the marketing and programming director of Ant Loot Books, our host and a nonprofit intersectional feminist press dedicated to publishing literature by those who have been traditionally underrepresented or excluded by the literary canon. Um, and Corda Ant Loot's mission is the belief that the written word is critical to understanding and relating to each other as humans. And through the sharing of stories, we strengthen ties across cultures and experiences, and at the same time, honor the hurt and loss and harm incurred through structural power imbalances, prejudiced and gendered systems, ancestral trauma. And so we uplift these voices in order to build a more just future. And so this is the work we are here to do today, but there is no reason this work can't be joyful and beautiful. And so before I invite our amazing hosts to start us off, I want to make a couple announcements. Um, first things first, this event is being recorded and it will be published online later this week. We will send out to all those who have RSVP'd and we'll publish it on the Antleap website. So if you need to dip out for a minute or if you want to share this with any of your friends, you'll certainly be able to catch the full event um, later on your own time. Um, we also have subtitles going. Uh, but if you're having any trouble following them, please send me a message in the chat. If you want any clarity on anything said, we'll do our best to make this experience as accessible as possible. And I encourage anyone else in the chat to join in in the support. Um, tonight is also air of Yom Kippur. Um, and for those observing Yom Kippur, this event should be done before sunset. Um, and this project also was made possible with support from California Humanities, which is a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And you can visit calhem.org for more information. And I can throw that link in the chat. Um, last thing, we have an interactive presentation that I am now linking into this chat. Um, um, it is in this presentation that you can find more information about every reader, organization, all the books, projects, everything we're talking about here. And it's also where you can find information to support everyone that you're seeing here. Um, we have links to buy books, contact information, donation information. Um, part of being in this community is the flow of support and we encourage you to hop in there and add in your own links for people in the Bay seeking mutual aid or Bay Area artists who you wanna bring attention to, or just start conversations about what home means to you. I wrote food in there 
And so I'm wearing a spam dress. I don't know if you can see, I haven't been looking at myself, um, but just to invite, I guess, and build home with all of you in ways that I would love to in person, but cannot. Um, and now I wanna invite Kim Shock, our host for tonight to join us on camera. Kim is an amazing poet and storyteller and weaver an activist and person with a whole bunch of amazing titles and awards that you can find in our presentation or with a quick Google search. She's very fancy and famous. Um, but what I'd like to share about Kim is that she's someone who every day builds community, builds home. And I've been lucky enough to connect with her through Aunt Loot. And she's had me over for dinner just to, just to build community and eat some Hawaiian food and talk about literature and our grandparents. Um, and it's these small acts of kindness and warmth that I think define the culture of the Bay Area for me. And it's these small acts that do build home for me. And so welcome, Kim. Thank you, Emma. This is, uh, I've been looking forward to this event quite a bit. Um, a lot of great people involved and I'm really excited. I was thinking with respect to the event, I was thinking about my vision of home and other visions of home that I've heard about. And it's my big hope that, um, that even for those who home has not always been um, a positive image that, you know, we can start individually reclaiming that space for ourselves. Uh, I was born in San Francisco and um, and it means a lot. The place means a lot to me, and I try to behave as though it's important. I I wanted to share that uh, even though uh, first peoples don't always have cultural connections that people expect. So anytime anybody says all first peoples, and that ends in anything, they're probably wrong. But in my experience, my people and many other people um, uh, are called the same thing as their place, the place that, they're, that they originate from. And, uh, or they're called the people from that place. So the connection is integral to identity. And I think that's what I wanted to add to that. So, um, our partner organizations for this event tonight are the Sigouriate Land Trust. Sigouriate Land Trust is an urban indigenous woman-led land trust that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. Through the practices of rematriation, cultural revitalization and land restoration, Sigouriate calls on native and non-native people to heal and transform the legacies of colonization, genocide, and patriarchy, and to do the work of our ancestors and future generations, that what we're being called to do. Also, the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, AEMP. The Anti-Eviction Mapping Project is a data visualization, critical cartography, digital storytelling, collective documenting dispossession and resistance upon gentrifying landscapes. Today, we will be hearing from a piece included in AMP's Black Exodus zine. Dislocation is a multi-platform publication and public workshop series centered around the issue of local housing justice. The first chapter, Black Exodus, builds upon the anti-eviction mapping project's commitment to centering communities as producers of social and historical knowledge. Activated by the unprecedented outmigration of Black San Franciscans from their historic neighborhoods, our goal with this project has been to foreground Black storytelling and art making. The zine aims to assert multimedia topography of Black history in San Francisco with an emphasis on Black cultural production, housing, and resistance. Black Exodus is centered around over 30 oral histories by long-term residents educators, community activists, community-based organizations, and artists that we gathered between 2017 and 2019. 
These stories are woven together with essays, original art, collages, timelines, and photographs, and spans more than a century's worth of memory of events, people, places, and movements that are particularly to Black life and experience in San Francisco. Black Exodus is available to purchase from Moments Co-op in Oakland and Green Arcade in San Francisco. They're 30 bucks a piece. If you can't afford it, they can be purchased through Black um, AMP at a sliding scale or for free for community organizations, schools, and libraries. All proceeds go to the continuation of making the book available to the public. The next Home in the Bay event will feature AMP's publication counterpoints. Now, I'd like to invite Jay Spaniolo to introduce Poets Reading the News. Jay. Thank you, Kim. Hi, I'm Jay. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I'm just so grateful to be in this space of, of human kindness. I think it's so critical in a, in a cruel society. And, um, you know, we use our senses to foster belonging when we say, I see you, I feel you, I hear you. Um, so that's what we try to do at Poets Reading the News is really bring in the senses and artistry to handle difficult things. It's uh, a newspaper that bridges uh, poetry and, and current events. So in essence, it's a newspaper written by poets. Um, so yeah, I've been really happy and excited to be involved in this project. And um, you can find more, more about our work out at poetsreadingthenews.com. Um, and yeah, we've been founded in 20, 2016, so it's been five years now in the Bay. Um, and I just would love to connect with all of you. So um, thanks so much. And I'm gonna also pass the mic now to Tiny and Dee Allen of Poor Magazine. We are those poverty scholars. We are those poverty scholars, those houseless sons, those houseless daughters, all those people you don't want to see, never want to be. Look away from we. What you going to do, a mass we? We are a city. The notion of poverty scholarship was born in the calles, prisons, street corners, community centers, welfare offices, shelters, kitchen tables, assembly lines, tenements, favelas, projects, and ghettos, all the places people don't look for educators, experts, leaders, researchers, linguists, artists, creative writers, and media producers. Poverty scholars are told our knowledge is invalid or legitimate, our speech is improper, our work, our choices criminal, our words inept. Yeah, we are those clients living in your fat file. We are those folks that you threw a crumb down and didn't even sit with for a while. We are D. Allen, tiny poverty scholar, Mutiago Silencio, Amir Cornish, Israel, Akio, Carillo, and so many more. We're just a few of a multiverse of folks who be living on the street, washing your sheets, and living every day in this stolen land. At Mama Festi, a different way than the man's plan. Poor Magazine, Poverty Scholars, Hopefulness, Decolonize Academy in the house. Back to you, family. Thank you, Tiny and Dee and everybody else. I'm always blown away by your energy and, uh, and commitment and truth. Now I'd like to introduce Karina Gould for the land acknowledgement. Karina Gould is Lijan Ohlone, is the chair and spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lijan. She was born and raised in Oakland, California, the village of Huichen, a mother of three, a grandmother of four. Karina is the co-founder and lead organizer for Indian People Organizing for Change, a small native run organization that works on indigenous people issues and sponsored the annual Shell Mound Peace Walks from 2005 to 2009. These walks brought about 
education and awareness of the desecration of sacred sites in the greater Bay Area. As a tribal leader, she has continued to fight for the protection of the Shell Mounds, uphold her nation's inherent right to sovereignty, and stand in solidarity with her indigenous relatives to protect our sacred waters, mountains, and lands all over the world. Her life's work has led to the creation of the Sequoia Tayland Trust. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this thing, Karina. Love you, Natalie. Thank you, Kim. Good evening, relatives. Thank you so much for inviting me here to be a part of this beautiful um, event, um, Bay at the Home. I want to really acknowledge Aunt Lute today and the um, historic, as a historic feminist press that have given voice to great leaders in our time like Gloria Anzaldúa, who would not have been heard of if this great press had not uh, put that work forward. Today, I get to be here on this Zoom with all of you in this virtual space, this space where my ancestors have been for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and wherever you are, wherever you're calling in from, wherever you're Zooming in from, you are on indigenous land. This land was never ceded to the so-called United States government. Um, and we continue to hold on to our sovereignty as we stand in these places that we call home. Behind me, you see a scenery. And this is not just any mountain. This is the mountain that our people were born to. We all have creation stories, no matter where we come from in the world. And our creation story is this creation place um, onto Yushtak. And to Yushtak is uh, the, our sacred mountain, which many of you may know as Mount Diablo. We believe that we were created there. Not only Ohlone people, but the other uh, tribes that we are a confederation of, the Bay Miwok, the uh, Yokuts, the Plains Miwok, the Karkeen people, the Patwin, are all from this particular mountain, this mountain that we hold sacred. I have the blessing to be in our, my hometown of Huchin, where I grew up in my entire life. I raised my children here. My, some of my grandchildren live here continuously. We have an unbroken tie to this land since the beginning of time. I welcome you into this space today as we begin to listen to the artistry and words of the people that are coming forward to share that with us today. I offer that we let go of today's worries and for this just short time, that we acknowledge the, our ancestors that brought us here to this space our ancestors from all four directions, from the east, the west, the north, and the south, the ancestors on whose shoulders we stand on, those that hold us up from above and below, on the sides of us, in front of us, and behind us, that continue to give us the strength to do the good work that we need to do on this earth. I pray for all of our relatives that are sick right now uh, with COVID and other things, that they find health and happiness, we pray for those that are um, following their ancestors to the other side. May they be joined with language and song and um, laughter, and that those of us that are left behind have a lighter heart knowing that they are okay. We pray for our waters, especially right now. We pray for our relatives in the, in the sky, our clouds, to continue to bring us fresh water for the next seven generations and beyond. We pray for those that live in the waterways of our oceans and our bays, our streams and our creeks and our lakes, our rivers. We pray also for us as human beings to come in right relationship with our earth, with fire, with our air, and that all of these elements continue to bless us for the next seven generations and beyond. We ask that you, each of you take a deep breath, let go of today's worries, be here present with these artists and these um, people that are going to give us uh, uh, the next big lift to get us through. And I thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful journey with you. I look forward to listening to all of you tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. It was great to see you. So 
we come to the part of the show where we're given the gift of listening to art folk. I'd like to I'd like to introduce Phyllis Bowie. Phyllis Bowie's work as a producer and host of the Living with Phyllis Urban Food Show, which informs people on food stamps, how to eat healthy on a low income from the local farmers markets, was awarded the prestigious Taste Award two years in a row. Ms. Bowie believes healthy food and sustainable shelter is our right to help obtain and maintain urban community gardens, cooperative grocery stores, food security education, black food, black farms, black home ownership is her life's mission. Please welcome Phyllis to the microphone. Can you see me and hear me? Cause I can't see me. Yes. Okay, so I'll go, I don't see myself. Does everybody see me? You're good, Phyllis. I see you. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's kind of weird talking where I don't see myself. <laughs> but anyway, um, hi, everybody. I, um, I'm Phyllis Bowie, and um, I am reading from, I kind of like holding stuff up. I'm reading from the Black Exodus um, Dislocation, the Anti-Mapping Project. And I was honored to be interviewed as a Native San, a Black woman, Native San Franciscan, and also a community activist. I call myself act, I'm more, I'm more advocacy of an activism right now um, around the gentrification and the inequality and the mass exodus of Black people in the last 10 years and definitely in the last five years. And so basically I was just asked questions and this is a transcript of my interview. It was very long. So I'm going to read, there's three sections. I'll read from all three sections. The first section is me talking about the historical migration of Black people leaving Jim Crow and coming to San Francisco and what we faced. And that was my family story. And then I'll continue on with my story and then conclude with what my mission is. So I'll start off with the Fillmore in the 30s and 40s oh, was considered a hot spot to be, not really. It was an undesirable area. It was full of immigrants. It was known as a blight area for immigrants. Immigrants from all over the world lived here in the Fillmore. Then I say probably around 1941, 42, 43, something like that, that the migration which is called the Great Migration of African Americans Escaping Jim Crow began. It was clear that people from Louisiana and Texas migrated to California, and my family came from Louisiana, Monroe, Louisiana. And when we came, we came with our savings, we came with our hopes, we actually came with money because we owned property in the, where we came from in the South. We had money. And so we came with money. There's some pictures here that are great. I'll show those later if I can. Um, and the whole family would be coming in to work in the shipyards and the orange fields and just to get away from Jim Crow. It was like, sunshine, California, let's go. We're here, we're here. We're finally gonna get equity. We're finally gonna get a good education and just a simple life where we're treated nice and we're treated like equals. Well, the only place that Blacks would be rented to was just during that time when Japantown became Japantown. They were still part of immigrants that lived in this area. Japantown came and then Japantown was shut down when the U.S. put the Japanese in internment camp. It was the same time when Blacks migrated from the South to escape Jim Crow but couldn't find a place to live except in the area that was called Blight area because of the vacancies that were left over from the Japanese being in internment camps. Oh boy, San Francisco, gotta love it. Love our history. It's really important for us to know our history, the truth. So that's when we spent our money. We bought the Victorians that were vacant. We, um, be, it became the Harlem of the West. And then after World War II was over, and of course, uh, welcomed the Japanese back, 
then it became basically Japanese and African-American sharing the same spot in the Fillmore. And we got along really well. That's the history of the stuff of the big migration. It was a big migration. Most of the Californians you scratch, most of the black Californians you scratch will be either from Texas or Louisiana. I wanna just show you if you can see, I can't see, but um, some of the old pictures from the migration, maybe you can see a little bit. And then this is actually my, um, my grandfather when he migrated with my step-grandmother. Hopefully you can see it. Um, and then this is a really good picture of the Harlem of the West when it, oh, I'm telling you Fillmore was hopping. Okay, so the second reading. So I'd say growing up in San Francisco in the 60s, it was just like a melting pot of human beings loving on each other and loving our cold, foggy city. And you know, it was during the time we were dealing with civil rights. My mother was a Black Panther. So it was like the cling cling and the ding ding of the cable car against the riots and some of the picketing for civil rights. As I got older, I saw some of the changes in the Western edition. We moved from Petrero Hill to the Western edition when I was in high school. So I've been in the Western edition ever since. Okay, that was a few years ago. Okay, you do the math. Uh, it was in 1974 that I was in high school. My best friend in high school was living here. Her family still lives here. Hi, Ramona, the Johnson family. We both went to a school that covered the Sacred Heart, Upper Pacific Heights, basically at the end of Fillmore. Fillmore is a long boulevard. So you would, we sometimes walk from Pacific Heights through down to our neighborhood, the Fillmore. So when you ask, how was it for me? I knew the shop owners. I knew the merchants. I remember Mrs. Deucen's hat. I'd go in and Ramona would go in and we would talk and laugh and we'd try on her hats. There was also an Ethiopian place. We'd go in and talk to them. And so during high school, sorry you guys. So during high school days, we would just kind of hang out. It was a barbecue place to go to. Then we'd say hi to everybody, all the merchants. But I remember it, I remember it like it was yesterday. The jazz era, of course, was a little bit before my past my time. I was in high school, but they still had a couple of clubs and definitely a lot of black merchants that owned so many businesses on Fillmore Street. A lot of athletes and celebrities, I can remember. But then it was also opened up another world to me. So from my experience, I think it was kind of unique, you know, to be raised by a single mom, ex-Black Panther, and going from Petrero Hill, Mayberry, and then moving into a predominantly Black area, the Fillmore, and then having that culture inside my home. My mother was an anthropologist, so we talked about history and culture and justice all of the time. The changes again, that's what's hard with gentrification. I gotta tell you, it's really hard. Both Fillmore Street and Divisadero Street, even before Midtown protest started, I got involved with what was happening. I'm still skipping down the street, happy. So I skipped down Divisadero Street to get my barbecue ribs for $5.99. And I find that they're closed. Another place has opened up more like a chain and they were there. The prices were so much more. I didn't see any African-Americans being served, nor did I see African-Americans having a job. I'm like, OK, Phyllis, relax. Things are changing. So I walked another block to go into where I get my hair grease. So I go into and talk to him. He's been there for 39 years and we just talk a lot. And he says, hey, Phyllis. I'm the last black merchant on the Visadero. And I was like, okay, well, I support you. I'll make sure I keep coming back here to get my stuff. And Jaheem was his name. I loved him. So 
I'm doing my thing. I come back a month later to get my hair grease. There's a note, a handwritten note that says, after 40 years of business, we are closing our doors. And right there, I just wept. To the right of me, I saw a new beer brewery. To the left of me, I saw a Starbucks. And I realized that I, I realized that I'm just saying, I didn't see any black people sitting out there with their pedigree dogs. I'm not judging. I'm just letting you know what my experience was. I'm standing there with my $6 wanting to get my hair moisturizer. Now, where am I going to go? Now we're talking 2016. It's not about people saying you need to get over it. Neighborhoods change. It's more about the little black girl, that 1% of the 3% still left in San Francisco, that little black girl that walks down to Visadell Street and they don't see themselves. How can you start reaching your dreams with something you think is tangible if you don't even see people who look like you. This issue is a bigger issue. It's a cultural issue. And so lastly, I will read this statement. You know, if if we've if you'd if you'd if you okay, if you would have asked me two years ago that I'd be in this situation being an advocate for fair housing at Midtown Park and that I would be doing actions up and down the streets of San Francisco and be on the stairs of City Hall talking to politicians, I would have said you were lying because that's not my natural personality. But I have to tell you, it's been the most joyous 24 months of my life. And I really believe that my whole childhood from being raised, you know, from my family migrating to get away from Jim Crow, from my mother being a Black Panther, from my father being in the military, to culminating in all of this, even for me, being in the entertainment industry, to come here, to come home. And it was in my heart. It's my root. San Francisco is my roots in justice. So wherever injustice is, I will always speak up. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phyllis. That was amazing. Um, we need to talk. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to introduce Arnaldo Garcia, who is originally from South Texas. Arnaldo Garcia is a culture maker, com community organizer, and poet based in Oakland, California. He edited and published Poets Against War and Racism, Poetas, Poetas contra la guerra en el racismo. You know what? Maybe if I could see. A poetry chapbook featuring five poets writing in Spanish and English, available uh, at the PAWR link. Arnaldo's work has been featured on La Bloga, Poets Responding at Poetry of Resistance, and in the upcoming book, Painting the Streets, co-published by Eastside Arts Alliance and Nomadic Press of Oakland. His work is available at um, two places, which I will put in the chat. Welcome, Arnaldo. I can't hear you, hon. Oh. Arnaldo, are you able to hear us? Hmm. Perhaps we can try plugging in your earphones and then plugging them. Hmm. One moment, everyone, we're having some technical difficulties. Should take a moment. Um, hmm. 
Hmm, still not hearing anything, Arnaldo. Um, perhaps we can, you can log out and log back in. Maybe we can hop to our next reader. Does that feel good to others? Sure, let's try that thing. <clears throat> so momentarily, Next, we have um, Fuifulupe Niomitolo, who is a Tongan Pacific Island scholar, storyteller, and community organizer. Her work centers on climate and land justice, protecting indigenous sacred sites, and ending violence against women. She's a UC president's postdoctoral fellow and facilitator of the Oceania Pacific Island Studies Research Working Group in the Department of Native American Studies at UC Davis and um, a stellar human being. Fui. All right, all right. Wow. Malo, malo, malo wakaina. You know, and what a, what a difficult time it is in our world. Um, and you know, uh, Kim, what a, what a great honor and a great blessing it is also to be introduced by you you are one of my heroes in this world. So what a great, great uh, blessing it is to be uh, introduced by you. So uh, relatives, I, I'm just really grateful to be here. I, I apologize that I'm coming to you right now instead of our good brother, Arnoldo, who also is just an amazing human being. I've heard him uh, per, per, uh, offer his poetry uh, several times in the past. And it is, it's just a great honor also to be in the same uh, space as you too, uh, Brother Arnoldo. Also, uh, Karina Gold, I forgot to what and always Karina Gold, as we say, malo, malo et tau hiho tau ba. Thank you so much, uh, Karina Gold, for honoring our sacred relationalities with those of us from Moana Nui, um, the lands and the oceans <laughs> that is now known as the Pacific region of the world. Uh, so, so relatives, I also want to, you know, we talk about ba also. For us as Tongans and as Pacific people and as indigenous people, right? all of us, we, we have systems or an ecologies of intimacies that so many of our relatives call. And for us, we, we call them ba, our systems of ba, right? of, uh, so ecologies of relationalities, um, our lifelines. And they're always interconnected and grounded, right? they're always grounded in the natural world. Often we delineate those uh, spatiality, spatialities as the feminine, and it is what we believe is a sacred, right? So these are our connections. And so I always want to say thank you so much uh, to everybody. In this, before, before, just before I read, everybody, please forgive me. I really have to give a, a, so much. I really want to pay to the ancestors that came before. Right, when we talk about Aunt Lou books that Karina Gold had, taught, had mentioned in her opening, it's really important to honor those ancestors, those feminist ancestors, women of color, queer women of color, who fought for us, who fought for us to have a space at the table that we have today. And one of them is our great ancestor, the great Gloria Anzaldúa. So we honor you. We honor you, Gloria, as well as the many other ancestors. Please forgive me for not mentioning your names. We thank you so much for giving us the space that we have today to tell our Noah or what we say so that we can talk story, so we can speak our hearts today. This, this story and everybody, uh, I really am not gonna do this in a Pacific way. I am gonna be very mindful of the time here. Um, uh, I am gonna tell a little story. It's a story about Bob. And it's a story about uh, um, 
actually what happens in Doha and in the Pacific that happens with the, with the coming of the London Missionary Society in the 18th century, and also this, this cycle of colonialism and white terror continues to, uh, to World War II and also the colonization of the US military. And, and white terror, I define it as, as a violence. It's, it's, a, it's a violence, it's a, it's a violence that's preoccupied with the normalization of violence on the bodies of Tongan women and girls, right? And this violence is directly, directly correlated uh, to the expropriation of indigenous lands and of the theft and the ex expropriation of indigenous land, right? And so in this particular story, and I tell of how the VA, we're starting to see the changes that happen, right? And, and also we're starting to see how heteropatriarchy is starting to foment uh, within Tongan families and the Tongan communities by telling a story about two people that I love so much, two ancestors that I love so much. My great grandfather, who was a Western trained doctor uh, and also a pastor in one of Tonga's biggest Methodist churches, right? Um, Dr. Siaosi Numetolu, on my father's side, my beloved grandfather, as well as my grandmother on my maternal side of the family, my beloved grandmother, Vaimona Makagafaki. So the story is it was at the changing of the seasons the moments of slippage, the in-between, the time when both light and darkness meet, oscillate into each other and just before the breaking. The time that encapsulates the multiplicities of Va, of the future, the present, and the past. And in the early morning hours in the second week of May, according to the markings on the Western calendar, when everybody was asleep, except for the spirits of the ancestors drinking kava and malaikula, the royal burial grounds and sacred site located in downtown Nukualofa. And while the hungry dogs furiously made it, the baby girl knew that the time was right to release her grasp of her umbilical cord and to come out of her mother Lithia's belly. The time of her entrance into the world early in the morning hours during the time of darkness with its pending edges of new light was however a time that was non-compliant and disobedient to the Western trained doctor's medical predictions. The Western trained doctor was the baby girl's beloved grandfather, Siasi Numedol. Known and respected throughout Donga, he was a Methodist Fifekao pastor and a Western trained medical doctor. Siasi had a hand in the birth of Tongan children throughout Donga Dapu, including the many smaller islands in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. The baby girl's birth didn't follow the Western calendar's classification of linear time. And yet the baby girl knew that she was right on time. You see, her birth followed the cycles of the timeline given to her mother, Lithia, by her grandmother, Vaimoana. And these stories were given to Vaimoana by the grandmothers and the grandfathers that came before. The old ones always here. They have never gone away. Vaimoana was a healer that used the old Tongan language, Tongan knowledges, excuse me. But she often kept this practice hidden from the public eyes especially from the scrutiny of her own family and relatives. As a commoner woman using the old Tongan ways, Vaimoana's labor was not welcomed. Her labor and the labor of other Tongan women, healers that centered Tongan cosmologies and knowledges were made illegal and invalidated so as to open the door for the entrance and privileging 
of the institution of Western medicine and to privilege the expertise of Western trained male doctors. The baby girl holds a memory that took place when she had grown into a young girl of about six or seven years old that takes place in her grandmother Vaimoana's home located in Loho Longo, a small town located in Nukualofatonga, the capital city. Vaimoana stepped out of her front door to quiet the nuisance of the barking dogs and she was met by relatives arriving from a long trip from Ha'anohapai. The traveling party included two daughters, their aging father in his late 60s, and two teenage boys, along with gifts of fish, taro, ufi, and galore for Vaimoana and her children. The family traveled long distances ac across acres of ocean from Ha'anohapai to humbly petition by Moana to remember their Ba and to use her healing hands to put an end to a collective pain shared by everyone in their family. The elder man carrying the suffering body was a distant relative to by Moana. He was once a renowned fisherman known throughout the Ha'apai ha Islands but he lost his vision many decades earlier to a ghastly accident during a storm that took place in the deep ocean or Moana. The accident not only took the fishermen's sight, but it abruptly took the lives of two men, close relatives that were like brothers to the fishermen. The irreparable losses that took place on the Moana that day drastically altered the fishermen's ba with the Moana. The fishermen began to fear and loathe the Moana. And for the first time in his life, he became afraid of the vulnerability of his smallness. He suddenly became afraid of the large body of salt water that encircled him. And he angrily denounced and severed his bow with her because of the losses and suffering that she represented in his life. The fisherman also changed his livelihood and he attempted to become a farmer and to make a living on the land. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that, okay? I know I, I don't have time. The Moana was his first and perhaps greatest love and the loss of his eyesight was a daily reminder and metaphor of his suffering and severed vow with her. In addition, in addition, his suffering was not a burden that he carried alone, for it haunted his daughters and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and everyone on the island. In a series of dreams, the fisherman's ancestors came to him and instructed him to make a pilgrimage to visit his relative Baimona in Tomatapu and to ask her to remember their Ba and to please share her medicine with him and to heal his vision. But the new vision for healing and liberations that the ancestors brought to the fishermen required him to do the most difficult work of his life. He was required to confront his greatest fear and to once again come face to face with his greatest love, the Moana. The ancestors told him that the fisherman was required to travel on the Moana on a small boat for several days until he reached the shores of Wafukavuna in Nukolofa, and then in the main island of Tamatapu. And the ancestors instructed the fisherman to go on the land and he would be led to the home of Fai Moana and her family living in Lavalo. And he was directed to ask her to remember. When the fit, okay, and I'm just gonna go on. So, um, by Moana and the fishermen were drawn together by Ba, relationalities and ancestral intimacies grounded in the natural world, the Fanua, our Mother Earth, our Moana, and solidified by their unrelenting faith in the sacred. As the story is told, this is when Maimoana, of course, meets her, her relatives uh, on this particular morning. 
She sent her older grandchildren to the corner store to buy kapapulu or tins of corned beef imported from New Zealand that would be cooked with yellow onions in a gravy made of flour, pork lard, and broth. And this dish would be eaten with a big pot of haka or cooked root crops, taro, manioke, and served uh, to, uh, to these uh, wonderful relatives that are, are traveling from hot by. Okay, and I go on. After the meal and a long conversation that included laughter, tears, and the endless recitation of the webs of genealogies, exchanges of gifts, Vaimoana proceeded with the fight of Fagatoma, or the administering of the Tongan traditional medicine that took place behind the house. The processes of remembering and honoring Va and sharing medicine was a ceremony. My Moana looked earnestly into her blind relative's eyes to assess the problem. And then she bent slowly to the ground and pinched a bit of earth into her forefingers. And with the spit from her mouth, she needed a small ball while she recited a chant a long prayer taught to her by her ancestors in a language that was unknown and not allowed within the boundaries of the Christian Sunday school, or even within the boundaries of her home. After some time and as the prayer came to a closing, Vaimona carefully placed small amounts of meticulously measured earth mixed with her warm and moist spit on the man's eyelids. And after some time, and when she saw it was ready, she used her four fingers to wipe the medicine away from his eyelids. And then she, she slowly moved his eyelids open, allowing him to bear witness to the luminous and bright world around him. And for the first time in decades, he was able to bear witness and he's, I'm just cutting guys, I'm just gonna cut that. Uh, the benevolent and crying faces of relatives that surrounded him. As the story is told, the fisherman looked at Vaimoana and everyone around him and wept large tears of joy. And when the tears fell on his mouth and into the flesh of his tongue, he tasted the moana, the salt water, intimate in its taste. And once again, his memory awoke and he st and started to tenderly unfurl. And he began to remember. He thanked the great, gra the great mother, the Mona, our beloved Pacific Ocean, the progenitor of the shared Va that connected him to the webs of lifelines that sustained him and his ancestors. The Mona's love is without end or beginning, always abundant. It cannot be mapped by the hands of Western cartographers or contained by the fear of Christian missionaries and their languages of progress. She is the heartbeat, the steady rhythm that is always here. The Moana grounds, nourishes, and heals their tongueness. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was just thinking while I was listening to you about um, the incredible honor of being the host for this. And also um, the way in which the current circumstances limit my ability to be a host. You know what I mean? Like uh, when the sound was being a problem, I was thinking, you know, I think I'd probably be passing out tea right now. So I'm really grateful to have an opportunity, I guess, in this way to uh, remake community in a different way, the way we're doing it right now. So I am going to see, we're all going to see if we can hear from Arnaldo Garcia now. Um, do please, Unmute yourself. You, I am here. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. That's Woo! so wow. good. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, so 
Yeah, I'm really honored to be here with all of you. I wanted to thank Karina Gold for wel welcoming us into Ohlone land and space. And um, my gr grandmother who raised me told me that if you cannot be who you're supposed to be, that it would kill me. She said, if you can't be who you're gonna be, it's gonna kill us. So when I finally understood what she was asking of us, asking of me, that's when I really understood what it meant to be a good relative. Um, I am two ages displaced from my traditional lands. First, Spanish was beaten into our mouths. That was two ages ago. Then Spanish was beaten out of our mouths. That was one age ago. Many from our lands, from my lands and my families were forced out and we became migrants. Indigenous people who carried out, who carried our ancestors and our descendants in our hands and our hearts. And we worked many times in the fields or like many relatives here in Oakland, standing at street corners to get work. And in the process, we've been enriching the culture of our neighborhoods and towns and feeding the world. But we're considered foreigners in our own lands. So I am gonna read a poem in English and Spanish as part of my struggle to, re to decolonize English and Spanish in service of recovering our place in the natural world in order to walk together, to walk at your sides. And just call, I'm from the other side, soy del otro lado. Soy del otro lado, del lado bravo, del lado tuyo, del lado izquierdo. Tengo el nido para tus abrazos. Soy del otro lado, donde los, donde los muros son las sombras que persiguen a las policías que defienden a los tiranos del mercado. Y el sol, el sol está a nuestro lado, el lado de la tierra, el lado de las lágrimas con sus sonrisas, el lado de la luna llena y vacía, el lado que es combustible para las estrellas, el lado donde somos íntegros, el lado que divide a las bestias, adomándolas con nuestra luz. El lado que nos abriga contra la rabia del dinero. Soy de ese lado con sus cuatro, seis, siete direcciones y sus cuatro, siete múltiples espacios donde los abrazos abren cielos y puertas, donde los llantos espantan a las fronteras. Las mujeres nos dan su espalda para cargarnos y sobrevivir del lado donde nuestros desaparecidos reaparecen. Soy del otro lado, del lado izquierdo, del lado tuyo. I am from the other side. I am from the side of the Rio Bravo. I am from your side, from the left side, where I have a honeycomb for your arms. I am from the other side, where their walls are shadows that chase down the police, the police that defend the tyrants of the markets. And the sun is on our side, on the side of the earth, on the side of tears with smiles, on the side of the full and empty moon, on the side that is fuel for the stars, on the side where we are whole, on the side that divides the beasts Taming them with our light, the side that holds us against the rage of money. I am from that side with its multiple directions and in multiple spaces where our embraces open up skies and doors, where our cries threaten borders. Women, women give us their backs to carry us and to survive from the side where our disappeared reappeared. I am from the other side, from the left side, from your side. I am from the other side, soy del otro lado. That was amazing. Thank you so much for that. Oh, just look at the web we're weaving, people. Okay, our next reader is Jan Steckel, who, whose work I really love as well. Uh, Jan Steckel's book, like Flesh Covered 
bone, covers bones from Zeitgeist Press, won Rainbow Awards for LGBT poetry and best bisexual book. Her poetry book, The Horizontal Poet, Zeitgeist Press, 2011, won a Lambda Literary Award. Her fiction chapbook, Mixing Tracks from Gertrude Press, um, 2009, and poetry chapbook, The Underwater Hospital, also from Zeitgeist Press, have also won awards. And she lives in Oakland, California, and reads all over the area. Catch her if you can. Jan Steckel. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and thank you, Arnaldo. That was beautiful. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Emma Rosenbaum, Jay Spagnolo, Tina Gray, Aunt Root Books, Poor Magazine, Poets Reading the News, Sogorea de Lum Trust, and the Anti Eviction Mapping Project. It is an honor to share a platform with all these amazing activists. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I live in the Allendale adjacent to the Fruitvale. Um, thank you, Cor Corina, for welcoming us to Stolen Olone land. Love song to my block. Sophie and Kimi show up on my doorstep in princess dresses, twirling to show me their tulle skirts, handing their tiaras to me so I can see their jeweled joy. Brando rings the doorbell with his mom. They are moving to High Street, but he will come by with his big brother so I can meet him when his brother finally gets a visa to come from Guatemala. When you are when are you moving? I asked the little boy we taught to read, who then forgot how to during the pandemic. Now, he says. Mary refuses to get a vaccine, even though her cousin was hospitalized with COVID and got sent home on oxygen. And Mary had to sleep in a purple pavilion in her fenced in front yard to quarantine until they got the test results back and knew she wasn't going to give it to the rest of the family. I wave and say hi, but I won't slow down to chat anymore. Carlos and Alicia's cleaning business shut down during the pandemic, so they got a small business loan and bought a taco truck. Remember when that conservative politician said that if we didn't clamp down on immigration, there'd be a taco truck on every corner? And the internet went wild with memes about how everyone wanted a taco truck on their corner. Well, now I've got one. Carlos and Alicia waved to me from it when I walked past. All day long, I see from my living room window their teenage boys hauling bags of tacos, burritos, and aguas frescas from their kitchen down the street to the truck. At night, the truck parks across the street from my house. I am happier than a pig in shit. Icy, Bear, and Canela used to growl whenever we walked by their front yard, but now they wag their tails for treats. Genio says there's a fourth little dog inside the house who isn't supposed to go on the couch, but she always gets up on the couch, even though he tells her no. Benjamin says he's running a dog farm, but thank God Biden got into office because now they won't revoke his temporary protected status. He can stay with Maria, two daughters, five grandkids on the Malito dog farm. Hugh started running the dogs on weekends because Maria has bursitis and they pull too hard. When he does, the whole neighborhood laughs as they rush by with their tails in the air, tongues hanging out, Hugh's ponytail flapping. The neighbors call out, ¿Quién está llevando a quién? Who's running who? And I'm going to finish uh, with a poem for my recently deceased friend, Oakland poet Darian Lenzel, son of Oakland poet Mark G. Darian volunteered on Poor Magazine's Homefulness Project, which feeds poor people in East Oakland. So his family asks that donations be made to them in his memory. We'll put a link for donations in the chat. Death of a Poet's Son. I thought Darian would be a good friend to have when I was old, sweet and thoughtful. One time during the pandemic, I mentioned on Facebook I couldn't get my pain meds refilled. Next thing I knew, he was masked on my doorstep, inviting me out for a walk. I can find Percocets or Vicodin, whatever you need. I thanked him, said I was fine. Afterward, it occurred to me that perhaps I should have offered to buy some from him in case he needed the extra cash. A teacher's salary isn't so great. Maybe Oakland public school teachers needed side gigs. But I think he was just being nice because another old lady poet friend said he checked on her too to make sure she was okay during the pandemic. He was a real gentleman, she said, gallant and kind. 
a barrel-chested man who loved music, poetry, life, his family, his girlfriend, good food and wine. He told me we suffered from all the concrete. It was important to have your bare feet on real dirt sometimes. He was so earthy himself that he drew his strength from the ground. His father, Mark, left a message that he had sad news. I decided not to call back until after my music party. I figured some old poet had died, someone majestic with a full life, doddering. But then Mark called again during the party, told my husband Darian died of a heart attack. I took the leftover food, agapanthus from the garden, walked it over to Mark's house, where his other son answered the door. Mark was over at Darian's apartment going through stuff, grabbing his hard drive and giving the cat away to the girlfriend. When I got home, the mandolinist and the accordionist played klezmer tunes with my cousin and traded Julia Vinograd stories with me. I got so drunk, I knocked my last margarita on the floor so everyone beat a retreat. I went on a jag, cried myself to sleep. I had forgotten to take off my makeup, but my eyelids didn't stick together when I awoke because I had cried off all my mascara and the floors were sticky. Mark went to the house of his dead son, stroked his hair and his beard, patted his belly, wiggled his big toe, and remembered changing his diaper because people shit themselves when they die. This wasn't Mark's first rodeo, being a Vietnam vet. He knew what happens and what to do. But what he just couldn't face was telling all the poets that his son died. For that, he called me because my Facebook page is already like the obit section of the paper. Remember the wine I poured Darian, the Persian food his beloved Holly cooked? He told me about Saturday Night Special, Bay Area Generations, offered to drive me to those poetry readings. Remember he spoke mom to the neighbor kids? How fluent his Spanish was? Remember how terrified he was when COVID came, standing in that classroom with all those kids, his father old, his mother sick. What do I do, Jan? How do I protect myself, my family, my beloved, the students? Remember how hard he had to work through the whole pandemic, teaching online, how scared he was of September coming, everybody back in school, and the COVID variants swirling around. You can't tell me all that stress, plus the lack of primary preventative care, didn't contribute to his heart attack. He is one of the excess deaths. His corpse may test negative for coronavirus, but he's a COVID casualty, too. Thank you. I'm looking forward now to hearing Ines Izquierda and then Poor Magazine authors. I'll put links for uh, Poor Magazine in the chat so you can donate. Thank you, Jan. So beautiful. Thank you. Oh, Dale. Sorry, I got confused. It felt like Dan had introduced Inez, um, who is going to share an incredible piece of artwork with us. Um, Inez Izquierda. Where are you? Stop. Just be there. Put your feet on the ground. Feel it stretching below you. Arrive here. So if you can imagine 200 years ago, there was an abundance in our territory that there was not even a concept of hunger or homelessness. For thousands of years, we lived like that until the missionaries came. that we don't exist anymore. Our people have always been here in the East Bay, enslaved at both Mission Dolores in San Francisco and Mission San Jose in Fremont.
Our people have always been here. In 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 here. Our people have always been here, and we are part of what many people think of as Ohlone. Ohlone is a generic term that we are trying to get away from as we ourselves decolonize. There are eight tribal nation territories with just as many languages and creation stories. It's important for people to understand that we had gone through three different colonizations in a very short period of time. And after that happened, the state of California was created by making uh, laws that made it illegal to be Indian. And so it was about the extermination of my people as well as other native people. We have been erased from history in the Bay Area and through history books. Indigenous people are still here. When the invaders came, one of the first things they did was try and destroy our amaranth. They could see that our food is our medicine, is our spirit, and they thought they would be able to destroy us by making amaranth illegal. They burned our fields. They cut off the hands of people that tried to grow or harvest amaranth. They did the worst things. But somehow our ancestors knew that we would need the seeds and they sewed them into their clothing and they braided them into their hair and they smuggled them through all the places that they were forced to go and they saved them generation after generation after generation. And somehow some of those seeds made it to us. And this year we grew amaranth on rematriated indigenous land in deep east Oakland. Each seed is like this tiny piece of hope that our ancestors had that we would make it. Each seed is the past and each seed is the future. What did your ancestors pass on to you? What seeds were you saving? What will you pass on? Every week we get phone calls and emails about ancestors being found as developments are being put in. Our shell mounds once ringed the entire Bay Area. There was 425 of them. And we began to do work around saving these sites in 1999. Our sacred sites in the Bay Area um, are continuously being uh, uh, attacked you know, last week I was called into Alameda because there is a big development happening and they're thinking that they might re try to remove 50 to 100 of our ancestors. So this is an ongoing process, a continual genocide and disrespect of our cemeteries.
To rematriate is to restore a sacred relationship between place and people. There needed to be places for indigenous people to reconnect. And we began to talk about this idea of using a land trust as a way of bringing land back into indigenous hands, sovereign pieces of land where we could do our languages and our ceremonies and we can grow food and medicine, a place where native people could just be native people. If you go past the railroad tracks and past the liquor store, all the way down 105th, deep, deep East Oakland, that's where Lashawn is, unceded Ohlone land, the first land returned to indigenous stewardship in the territory. know that it is essential in this time for the next seven generations that we stand together. Decolonization is not a metaphor. Decolonization is about the return of indigenous land and life ways. And everyone has something they can contribute to that. Because right now, wherever you are, you're on indigenous land. Hi, I'm Karina Gould. I am the, one of the co-founders of Segurite Land Trust. And I just want to thank you all for coming. An opportunity for people from all walks of life that live in our territory now to re-engage in the land in a different kind of way, to think about the possibilities of what it would be like to have places that we can talk about not only the past, but the resiliency and what we can uh, do. I think this part is not part of the video. We can stop it now. Sorry, that was... Thank you. My bad, but it's cute to see Karina. That was again. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm blown away. I don't know about everybody else. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Ines. Um, so next we have um, poor press um, who are black, brown, disabled, indigenous, houseless, poverty scholars who have released eight powerful books of poetry, art, and liberation about their struggle, resistance, and solutions, including the Homefulness Handbook, How to Build a Homeless People's Solution to Homelessness. Um, and I'm going to let them talk about this. Poverty scholars. Anthropology, ethnography, psychology, the study about us, without us, our spirits, our cultures, our traditions, through your lens, deconstructing our struggle while our communities are dismantled and left in rubble, acquired with academic privilege, linguistic domination gifts, long ago sorted and separated in American school systems, the cult of independence and the myth of inclusion, how are you going to fly to our lands in Uchin, India, and Bangladesh, but not so much as slice off a piece of your privilege or access? Yeah, so we got a new plan. It's a new kind of sistership, mothership, brothership. It's called poverty scholarship. And it includes all the voices of all of us, poor peoples, 
all across Mama Earth, working, holding, surviving by any means necessary. Because like we say, change won't come from a savior, a pimp, or an institution. Change will only come from a poor people-led revolution. Pro-press is a Cohen indigenous people-led movement. We are building, fighting, creating Cohen indigenous people solutions every day. Hopefulness is one of those solutions, and so is Pro-press. And tonight we are we are going to give you a debut of eight new Pro-press books in the 2021 collection. So I do want to just back up to let people know that all of the books that come up, um, we're going to do our best to do the screen share um, that we are struggling over here on the digital streets with really no help tonight. Um, so bear with us a little bit and um, we're going to do our best to make it that we bring up the authors at the same time. So hold on one second, family. All right. Uh, so first of all, poor press again is one of our ways of making sure that uh, poor people's voices are heard and not marginalized. Oftentimes we are talked about without uh, by corporate media, uh, by even the publishing industry. Big love to Aunt Lute for inviting us in for making this space. Big love to our warriors like Karina Gold, Inez, Kim Shuck, Fui Fui, um, and also love to Kim, to uh, Jan and to Arnoldo tonight. Um, just the work is power, powerful and your voices. Thank you for that medicine. But I wanna say that uh, this work is extremely hard because we are hurt people oftentimes hurting each other and also trying to walk into liberation on this stolen land. And none of this that we're doing would be possible without extreme work, but also prayer and humility. Uh, prayer with and um, connected to all of our pan indigenous, black and brown and poor people who die on these streets every day because of the lies of capitalism and land theft and the genocide of colonization. And as we bring up the, the medicine of poor press from each of the authors, and we also bring up the medicine and the template of homefulness, a homeless people's solution to homelessness, um, I have to give so much love to Segorte Land Trust, Sister Karina and Fui and Inez and Deja and so many more who, when we asked permission to be here, which is what all poor people do, which is what all indigenous peoples have always done, uh, which is a direct resistance to settler colonial terror. Um, not only did they welcome us in, but they made space and love and we appreciate you and we love you. And it's so blessed to be here with you. Um, and just so people understand that Fui and Karina and others are part of our family elders council uh, because we never engage with the police, uh, with the people who test arrest and incarcerate us. And we have a liberation school. We have a radio station, Poor People's Radio. Uh, we also have um, and are right now engaged in building houses for fellow houseless people and the city of Oakland is blocking us. But we'll get into more of that fun later. But uh, it's a self-determination uh, and poor people's solution in real time that my new word were mama festing. So it's really powerful for us to be sharing tonight in this space as we talk about home, as we talk about land and that beautiful video that you created in there so much medicine I was lost in there. Uh, so thank you. It's gonna be required reading for the for the youth and, um, and adults. Uh, and I just also wanna say that none of this would be possible also without our solidarity family. Uh, real talk, we live in a capitalist system. Money is real. Blood-stained dollars need to become love-stained dollars. And so we teach folks with race and class privilege 
about the concept of radical redistribution and community reparations, which are original thoughts that we came up with, original theory that us poor people came up with, which is part of poverty scholarship, which is a powerful textbook led by and created by poor and indigenous people. People should check it out. Um, but I say that to say uh, they've radically redistributed uh, not only their bloodstained dollars into lovestained dollars, but their resources, their AKKdemia skills. So I wanna shout out Asa, uh, who is one of our powerful um, liberators of the graphic design skills, Lori Herrera, uh, who made this flyer, um, and also the folks who um, stand with us, like Maya, who also made flyers and created and is helping, and Paige, and so many more. So as we bring up the powerful poverty scholars, um, we're going to ask each reader to uh, show, share their books. And um, our first, our first poor press author uh, is none other than Miss Audrey Candy Corn. Uh, can we bring her out of mute, out of uh, digital silence into digital volume? And here is her cover, Mama Audrey. Yes, greetings, family. I'm here. Should I start talking? Yeah, go for it, babe. Go for it. Greetings, family, extended family. We are all one. My name is Audrey Candy Corn, a grieving yet breathing mother. I coined the word revolution and revolutionary. I like to I take, take the R -E -E out of the revolution and put the L O V in. So with that being said, the book that um, I have provided is entitled Oakland, Iraq, the home of the Cubs of the Panthers is the subtitle. Um, and this, I'm Audrey Candy Corn, the author of this book. And um, I am a part of Poor Magazine, Homefulness Family. And um, that's pretty much all I have to say. The book is kind of the title states Oakland and the statistics and the genocide and all of the things that takes place. Um, also to Iraq because we're all dealing with systematic issues and PTSD and we're dealing with a war, a war cry. And so living in Oakland and being raised on the ocean land and things of that nature is what embodies this book of survival of the fittest. Thank you, Mama Audrey. This is the cover of the book. Um, and of course, those are youth poverty scholars, Amir and Zaire with uh, Decolonized Academy, powerful poets of their own right and sons of Mama Audrey Candy Corn. Because uh, as we build in a poor people led liberation movement, uh, that is not um, just for the seniors or just for the youth or just for the families. Those are capitalist separation nations. Um, a true indigenous movement is all nations, all generations. And so we thank you, Mama Adi, and check out her book. It's, order, it's available for pre-release on poorpress.net. All right. And so we're going to bring, yes. And so we're going to bring up the next. Uh, I think that's you, Dee. Can you bring up the next person while I try to share? Who is that? The next person I'm about to bring up is new to the Poe Press family. And this is his first book, Crip Lyrics by Val Vera. Oh, my deal. Go for it, Val, from Texas. <laughs> Thank you, Tiny. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for creating this event and uh, allowing us to uh, share the space together. Uh, my book is Crip Lyrics, The Unapologetic Poetry of Disability. Uh, my name is Val Vera. I'm a disability justice activist and author. And uh, a little bit about my book. Um, it's, it basically amplifies the voice of the disability community. Um, it expresses my personal experiences and perspectives as a disabled person. And finally, it serves as an art piece 
Um, as each poem is accompanied by an illustration created by a disabled artist, uh, Melissa Marie Eckhart. And I'm gonna read one of the shorter pieces in the book uh, just to give you guys a little taste. Uh, this poem is called Worthy. Worthy we are, our bodies, though different than theirs, breathe, move, yet they disapprove. Rejection of our existence, objection to our resistance. Ableist spirits keep us at a distance. Worthy we are, yet segregated, isolated from society's circles. Their words, actions, silence mothers, the scarred hurtful. Worthy we are, our bodies, though different than yours, rise, resist, we will insist. Rejection of your able privilege, objection to your rabid pillage, crib chants loudly surround the village. Worthy we are, yes, agitated, aggravated by society's circles, your words, actions, defiance utters from the scarred worthful, worthy we are. Thank you. Woo, woo, woo. Beautiful. Again, you can shout out to uh, Brother Leroy Moore. Uh, we know part of the co-founders of Homefulness and Poor Magazine and invite, introduced us to the powerful Valveta, a brown crip warrior from Tejas. Check his work out. It is available for pre-order on poorpress.net as those poor people are making sure we are checked. Thank you, Val. Take it away, Dee. Who's next? And the next person I'm going to bring up will be someone who's an old member of the, of the Poe Magazine family, but new to Poe Press, as this is her first book. What's my address by Lisa Gans? Oh. Hey there. Okay. My name is Lisa Gans here. Hey. So I just jump in, right? Come on in, yeah. Lisa. Take it away. And I'm trying to find your your cover. Take it away, Lisa. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, this is uh, this will be my first book. I'm so grateful to be part here, part of this uh, this event, and grateful to be with Poor Press. I'm going to read a short piece from my book called "What's My Address," and this piece is called "Alone Together." I made it to the seventh grade into a junior high where I had attended four out of the five elementary schools that funneled kids there. The first day of school came and went with ease. I was established instead of new and dare I say popular. I practically danced home past our neighbor's huge houses, tidy flower beds and early autumn bloom, fresh cut lawns, literal picket fence to find my mom defeated on the couch. I'm sorry, Legs, I tried. We gotta be out of here by 8 a.m. tomorrow. I don't know where we're gonna go. We're out of places to go, my exhausted mama sobbed. I stood there a moment, my school book still in my hands. The clock was ticking, such a rare occasion. My mom and I, alone, together. I'm done, I said to my mom as I scooped the coins from the table she was slumped over. I'm gonna go get Marty from the bus stop, I said. I gathered up what little we had into a pillowcase, homework, toothbrushes, soccer stuff, and walked away. What are we gonna do, Marty asked. We're gonna call Grandma Ganser, I said confidently. People just kept passing by, driving home from work. The cars and trucks seemed fresh off the lot as we walked to the nearest payphone. My mind was racing. I heard the familiar growl of my brother's stomach. How was school, I asked. I was making decisions for both of us that would impact us for the rest of our lives. That's what I got, fam. Thanks for having me here. Whee! Powerful author, poet, poverty scholar, and a warrior against the, the, the fake armies of the state, Paul Lice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. We love you. Um, again, you can get for pre-order at poorpress.net. 
And next, who's next, uh, Dee? The next author up is Ingrid Delion. De is Ingrid here by any chance? Ingrid, aquí estoy, aquí. I don't think so. I want to say, unless I get interrupted, which would be amazing. So first of all, for those of you who know some of the poor family, uh, we've been literally working, uh, speaking, doing work in the streets where all us poor people live, uh, starting back when me and Ma were living in our car, living in doorways, living in bus shelters and wherever else us poor people hold on by any means necessary. Um, Ingrid has been part of our familia um, as part of also a powerful one of our many proyectos called Voces de Migrantes en Resistencia. That's Voices of Immigrants in Resistance, um, starting back in 2006 when we know in this stolen land and the false border bans, that didn't start with the Cheeto in the white people house um, has been on for many, many, many years. Um, Ingrid and Gloria, Esteva, uh, Maria, and Molina, and Moteado Silencio, and so many more are part of that powerful project started by um, my mama and other warriors, um, and literally come from these places. Right now, Ingrid is not on here because as a mama of four who's been separated by false borders, uh, she's still like most of us poverty scholars of poor magazine uh, is out doing the poor people labor that we have to do to survive. So she's cleaning those corporate offices as we speak for some measly hourly rate. And um, she's one of many families that the city of Oakland is blocking from moving into a space where she will no longer have the boot of rent on her exhausted neck. Uh, but city of Oakland thinks parking uh, and a $40,000 impact fee is more important than people's lives. We already know. It's one of the reasons we as poor people launched humbleness um, so that mamas and papas and aunties and uh, abuelitas could rest from the lie of rent. But anyway, Check out her book. It's always from the heart and it has to do with being hated uh, by community for being too poor. And it is in both English and Spanish. Um, and again, you can get it on poorpress.net. The, the next author I'm gonna bring on Go ahead. has been with, this is her second book with Poe Press. And her new book is called Kai Talks About the Missions, Whee! which is a sequel to her first book. Hello, my name is Kai. Hi there, my name is Angel Hart. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. All right, thank you everyone for allowing me to be here to the organizers and everyone else who's in attendance. Um, again, my name is Angel Hart and I'm a poverty scholar and a future resident of homefulness. Uh, my book, Kai Talks About the Missions, is a second installment in a series of children's books with Poor Press. In this book, Kai explains the truth about California missions and what his ancestors, the Lashana Ohlone peoples, endured. Inspire for the need for the children to learn the truth about the land. And, of course, with permission from Karina Gould, the traditional spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashana, excuse me. This book was created as a sequel to my first book, Or Say To Hey, My Name Is Kai. And I'd like to mention that Kai is a storyteller in this book, um, and he's Karina's grandson. So I'd like to start by reading from pages 11 and 12, and then a little excerpt from page number 17. Spain wanted a lonely land too, so the Spanish crown appointed Junipero Serra, a priest in the Catholic Church. Said I went from what is now San Diego to the Bay Area to steal a lonely land the Spanish called dibs on. As these colonizers went up and down the coast, they used violence to enslave my ancestors as a workforce. My ancestors built Mission Dolores in what is now San Francisco and Mission San Jose in what we now call Fremont, California. My ancestors were forcibly baptized in the Catholic Church and were prevented from returning home to their villages. Then I'll skip to page 17. Today, kids in the fourth grade history in fourth grade history class learn about First Nations of the land that we now call California. K 
kids learn how my people used to dress, what we used to eat, and how we used to live, not realizing that the Ohlone are still here. Then, when kids go to the fifth grade, they learn about the California gold rush and never hear or continue to learn about my ancestors anymore. Thank you for hearing me. Oh, thank you, Angel Heart. Beautiful. Um, and Poor Press has a whole group of children's books with different protagonists and the real history and history like we always teach our young people as indigenous and poor people, we don't lie to them. I wanna lift up that Angel Heart, like uh, Brother D said, has two, this makes her second book, um, powerful work. And when you're trying to teach your young people of the real story, um, and also Leroy Moore has children's books on there, and so do I. Um, so, and so does Mama Audrey Candycorn and, and Amir and Zaire. So check them out, check out um, Angel Heart's work. It's powerful shout out to her work um thank you, thank you. yes all right and, and the next book and the next book that will be showcased will be the second book by mutiano silencio one of our og code press writers and we're gonna hear um oh, sorry we're gonna hear from uh one of our powerful migrante indigenous warriors formerly houseless, currently homeful, in homefulness, um, my brother Isaiah Munoz talking a little bit about it. Gracias, Tani. Gracias a todos los que nos están oyendo y por venir a esta reunión muy importante para todos nosotros que somos Javier um, y seguimos peleando por lo mismo, lo mismo que es you know, nuestra revolución. Um, Chimali. Chimali es una forma de rezo a todos nuestros ancestros que usualmente rezamos a toda la madre tierra, que la cual no, si no fuera ella, no, no estuviéramos aquí. Y Chimali, en cada escudo que simboliza uno de los guerreros, como la. la El, el sol, la, el, la madre agua y todos uh, que adoramos directo con la madre tierra. So, eso es lo que nosotros rezamos en el modo de danza oh, que man. hacemos, tipo de danza y honoramos a todos los cuatro, uh, el sol, la tierra, el agua, todo y la madre tierra. Oh, so, es lo que es, significa Chimali. Es un escudo para honorar a todo lo que es la madre tierra. Uh, so, my brother Motiado Silencio, uh, many of you all know the powerful work of homefulness and the Pope Poets Project, No Moot, a longtime brother, other son of my mama D, um, a warrior, uh, but also bringing back his. Uh, his uh, indígena conciencia that was stolen from him as a brother from the other side of the false borders is one of uh, the powerful warriors who along with myself teach the young people about the, the culture of danza Azteca and, and the different ways that we pray in our traditions. Um, he put together a whole collection of uh, the shields that are all filled with the codices, the indigenous um, ways that uh, our communities taught, um, not just with these colonial palabras, not with these, these false alphabets, um, but actually with our images, um, with our ancestors and with our spirits. Um, and we know that we all come from different places. One of the powerful work of um, a poor people led movement that's operating with humility is one of my sayings, uh, the revolution will not be melted in a pot. Uh, so we all honor wherever we come. And I urge people to check this out. It's a beautiful book. Again, shout out to Asa Ikida, who's helped us so much as a, a revolutionary graphic liberator uh, in this work, putting this together with the powerful artwork of Moteado. Um, it's bilingual, um, as many of our books are. 
Uh, so bilingual, I should say, in the two colonial languages, that is. <laughs> We're slowly but surely moving off that paradigm, but I uh, urge folks to check it out. And it again is available on poorpress.net. Who's next? And finally, the last book that'll be showcased for tonight. Well, along with Home for Miss Handel. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> the next to last book that will be showcased will be a collaborative effort from us all called The Home for Miss Handel. Um, yeah, okay, hold on one sec. So, there we go. yeah, there's the front cover, folks. Um, so we say homefulness, a homeless people solution to homelessness. And one of the pieces that is really important is in the homefulness handbook. It's always been a template uh, to show fellow poor folks, fellow poverty scholars, again, with this concept of poverty scholarship launched by my mom and me and myself and uh, Ken Moshesh and other co-founders of Homefulness and Poor Magazine back in 1996 about the ways in which we do not have to follow non-profiteer and uh, corp rape and bankster solutions uh, and politics to hate um, as poor people but we actually have our own solutions. And uh, we're doing that right now in something again that I call mama festing. Um, and we have put this long awaited handbook together as we're people right now helping uh, folks struggling with the lie of poor people hate in a capitalist system and the violence of sweeps all across mama earth uh, up in so-called Bellingham, Washington, um, and so-called Bend, Oregon, and Corpus Christi, Tejas, who want to start their own homefulnesses. This has always been a template, and it is not easy to do, uh, because we are humbly understanding that when us poor people try to take back land um, and moving beyond the settler colonial lies, I mean laws and codes, uh, they move in on us with guns and tanks. Uh, shout out to Moms for Housing. Um, shouts out to Move Africa, Long Live John Africa. Uh, shout out to so many more. And so this is not uh, one uh, note. It is not simple. It is not a panacea. Um, and it doesn't happen without teaching young folks with different forms of race and class privilege about radical redistribution so that they can turn their bloodstained duck bucks into love stained bucks um, through a process that we call people school and many more other lessons. Uh, but I urge people to check it out. Um, and if you want us to come to your street corner, encampment, town, school, church, or university, we'll be there teaching, sharing, loving, and liberating. And the last book that we're gonna be showcasing at night comes from the author who's here right now. Oh, oh, okay. This, book, this is the umpteenth book from Tanya. <laughs> it's not and the umpteenth book. Oh, Chris. <laughs> it is definitely not the umpteenth book. Um, so I, I, of course, I'm having trouble finding uh, my book because that's the no. one, that's the one book that I did not um, but on the desktop, sure. let's just say family, I have trouble um, prioritizing my own work, um, which is you real. There. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it, folks. Bear with me. Um, and I do want to say it's kind of powerful because there was a couple people who encouraged me to do this, and I want to shout them out. Um, and one of them was Asa. Again, I love you, Asa. And um, also some other cats like Leroy Moore, my bruh, um, who are like, no, Tiny, you got to put that out. You're a poet and you got a lot of powerful work. Um, After so many years of putting out, <laughs> of putting out school textbooks, 
quote unquote handbooks <laughs> and numerous children's books. In fact, also know. known as Lisa Gray Garcia, comes out with her debut poetry book, Sidewalk Motel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dee. Um, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm not going to take much time, actually, because I know I want to be um, able to have you guys come back together. And I don't know if anybody's still here, but I do want to say that um, that it's a that it's an honor for me to even have the space um, as a poverty scholar to even have the space to do something like a collection. Um, I stand humbly shoulder to shoulder with my fellow houseless and poor mamas um, who don't have a pot to piss in and a home to call their own. I stand shoulder to shoulder with my own mama for without whom there would be no me. And always know that she did her best as a tortured child who had nothing left in her body to hold another human, but made it happen somehow. I stand together with all the folks like Shannon Marie Bigley and Desiree Quintero and Leanne Blair who die on the streets because of the lie of sweeps and whose voices you're not hearing tonight. I stand together with my fellow poverty scholars like A. Fay Hicks, like the beautiful, powerful Papa Bear, our panhandler reporter, um, and all the victims of polized terror and capitalism, but specifically the ones who died because somebody wanted to help them. Luis Dimitro, Gungara Pat, Steven, Tyler, our brother Tyrell Wilson in Clanville. I stand together with all the people you don't see, you never wanna be, and you look away from we. What you gonna do? Arrest we? We're in your city. Tell the folks what this book's about, if you can. So it's a poetry anthology, um, but it's also, and, and it's all the, so most of the poems I've written, and for any of you guys who like some of my poems, um, you can check it out. And I won't say much more because of time, but I will say there's also the potionary in there, because you know I like to mess with the colonial language. So if any of y'all need that little extra what the heck is Tiny talking about with her capitalism and her corporation? Get this book because it'll give you your pocket uh, potionary and you get those wordsmiths. And I'll just end with these words, which is a small piece of a, a poem in there. This poem is in honor of homeless mamas, poor mamas, low wage mothers, and no wage mamas. This poem is in, under, in honor of indigenous mamas, incarcerated mamas. This poem is in honor of all those poor women and men, and yes, I said men, because don't sing me that song about gender again, who fight and struggle and steal and beg in every crevice and corner to keep our kids in a bed, who dress and feed with tired hands, who answer cries over and over again, who can barely make it, but sometimes do, and still raise all the world's people like me and you and you. Oh, Mateo, oh, thank you so much, family. Thank you, Aunt Lou. Thank you. Thank you, poorpress.net, and we're done. Thank wow. you. Thank you so much, Tiny. Everyone, I mean, everyone needs to buy all of these books for one thing, because they are treasures. Um, but also just everyone, thank you, Kim, who has been such an amazing shepherd through this. And thank you to Karina and to Phyllis. And I feel like everyone, there's so much talk of like, mothers and remaciation that in like the aunties in the, our lives that feel so meaningful in this conversation um, about home. And I just feel so much gratitude. My mom is here. Hi, Helene. <laughs> but yeah, I thank you all so much for participating. If everyone wants to be on camera to say a farewell, we can chaotically unmute as is yeah can i just ask everyone to unmute and give emma and kim a huge hand for making this happen Yay. Yes, Emily. thank you all so much we will be distributing 
a recording of this, um, I guess next week, ideally tomorrow, but we'll see what I get to. Um, and we also have the chat recorded. So if anyone had some confusion with links, I know there was some questions and I'll be able to send that out as well. Um, and I put a survey in the chat as well, but we'll keep the interactive presentation up so that people can continue to look through it and find resources. But thank you all so much. Have a lovely rest of your night and week. And I hope that you all continue to build home and especially build home with all of us by thank you everybody thank you have a good night thank you everyone you can't see me but i'm saying good night bye everybody you're all amazing good night